uh, I believe that there ought to be some check and balance in this, and that's why we need uh, at least a court's, a court's voice. And that if there are 47 states in the United States and only three of them uh, simply give a total 100% um, discretion to the state attorney, we are operating in the minority. This can, this can be strengthened. And you said that there's layers with which uh, your office has who signs off, who signs off, who signs off. And I think that most of those are, are lawyers. And I see no harm in the court being an additional check mark, one more sign off, that's also a lawyer. I need parity. Uh, black parents are wanting parity. There's been unfairness in the system. And uh, a few years ago, uh, when the U.S. Supreme Court found, uh, I can't remember that case, but I'm sure uh, that a public defender, uh, two public defenders sitting on the front row behind you, remember when the Supreme Court uh, reverse cases and told Florida that they were being too damn hard on the children who were sitting in, in, in for life sentences. That's difficult. We have to go back and look into the system of injustice that we have now, and a lot of children are falling down to a system that's too hard. And I'm, I'm for being, you know, um, I'm not weak-hearted with regard to punishment, but I am fair-hearted with regard to race. And right now, the system is not. Uh, all the data ver verifies it. Now, the 14,000 children uh, who have been prosecuted as adults uh, in Florida since 2009, I would, I would, I would be willing to bet that more, more than 60% of them are black children. And I'm also willing to bet that when you look categorically at each of the offenses uh, by race and by age, by gender, you're going to find that the black kids are direct file more often. That is an issue that needs an additional voice from the court because state's attorney, not, not saying your office, not impugning your office. I'm saying what the data says, that the data is saying that the state attorney with sole discretion is discriminating against black children. Okay. Well, if I may respond, sir. Yes. I, I don't know. Go for it. Sure. Um, well, obviously, we have a gross overrepresentation. Um, throughout the criminal justice system in our minority. And I agree, and I'm happy to speak on that issue. And I think it's a, a systemic problem, and I don't think it's just found. But I, I believe that the better, if you look at the, the statistics that you're pulling, one, I, I would absolutely categorically deny racism on my behalf or on my office's behalf. But I will suggest that there is, no doubt, an overrepresentation in the minority community inside the criminal justice. And we need to work at why that's overrepresentation, and we need to do it systemically. Now, if you're talking about politically trying to do that, I would suggest to you that, the, that we have seen greater responsiveness. We have 599 circuit judges in the state of Florida, and you can't run on, against them on an issue. You have 20 state attorneys. So if you want a political responsiveness, you can sit there and say, Jack, I want to run against you, and why did you direct file this case, that case, and the other case? And you can pull the numbers. Or you can do the same thing in Jacksonville, or you can do the same thing in Miami about the state attorneys, where as a judicial race with a the broadness, and that's why I said that you have one judge would be deciding whether to direct file, and that's completely alien to the one who would actually be just a, handling the case eventually. So I believe that you'd find that we can combat and look at those cases with greater continuity and fidelity by having it consistently with your elected state attorney, who it is completely appropriate for me to respond. So on a case-by-case -case basis, I'll be happy to respond um, to that. Now, you've mentioned some other states that there's a relatively small amount of people who do give this. Most of the other states, what they have is they have statutory provisions where it's mandatory for direct file based on the charges, the ages, and some of those. Once again, I would suggest to you that's generally going to be more harsh. In other words, if you have a, a youth who sits there and commits an armed robbery, it doesn't go discretion. It goes automatically to adult court or a capital sexual battery or a homicide or these violent crimes. So I would suggest to you that the system that we have now actually allows me to decide not to send it um, where if, you, if, you, if we go to the other states, it's going to be, once again, the Florida legislature, when they bright line it, they're going to bright line it not to completely give the state attorney discretion, which is what I'm trying to argue. They're going to bright line it and say anybody who commits a crime of this severity is automatically in the adult system. And, and that, that's why 
the check and balance, I'm still going to have a circuit judge who hears, once they hear all the evidence, have the ability to decide, no, I think that this child should be handled by the juvenile system. And unless it's a case where they've previously already been adjudicated to be an adult, they can still sentence them as a juvenile. So I'm sympathetic to exactly what you said, and we're trying to address it. Yeah, and I want to say, if I might, Mr. Make sure to be perfectly clear that the point of the academic studies, I know that if you're talking about repetition, the number of offenses, perhaps a kid keeps doing the same thing at all. I know that if it's a heinous act, depraved, willful, just despicable crime, it could be direct. What I am suggesting is that when you look at category and age and gender and category of offense, that when they're equal offenses committed, that race is a factor because the direct filing, I'm not talking about severity, any of that. I'm saying when it's the same thing, the scholars have illustrated that something is awry in the discretion, and it seems to be race is one of those points. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have Commissioner Dozier in queue to speak. I think I had one more commissioner. Okay. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know we're right at the beginning here. State Attorney, thank you for joining us right now. I've only got a couple of quick questions. I'm going to save the rest for the agenda items since we've got a lot of other folks here, and I just wish we could all do that together. All right. So is it true, you just mentioned that at some point when the judge hears evidence, they're going to have a decision, but if a minor is charged as an adult, they will be in the system. So they're going to the detention center or something else just as an adult would before they appear before a judge, or is that first appearance? So if you have a 16, 17-year-old who's arrested, they're going to be initially taken to the juvenile receiving center. There's an algorithm that decides how many points they get on whether they're held detained or not. At that point, the case is referred to our office. We make a charging decision. Generally with juveniles, it's what's called a petition. It's a formal charge. If we believe, the way the system is currently what I've said, if based on the history, the crime, and all the circumstances, our office believes that it should be direct filed, once again, my head of juvenile makes a recommendation. It then goes through all of my chiefs who are the felony prosecutor leads. Then it eventually comes to my desk. And instead of filing a petition, we would then file some paperwork, which is called direct filing, so that we would end up filing either an indictment or an information bringing charges. That would eventually, that case is still going to go. There are circuit judges either way. Right now you have Judge Terry Lewis, our juvenile judge. You have four different judges who would be your circuit judges in each of the divisions. It's still going to go to a judge. They're still going to have their due process. They're still going to have. There's actually another way. They can actually waive into the adult system. For instance, if a juvenile wanted to have a jury trial, they don't have that right in juvenile. They could do that and get into the adult court if they wanted to. I guess my question is there are minors, and we're not just talking about 17, 18-year-olds or 14-year-olds, others, not just here across the state, that may be caught into adult detention facilities. Yes, but they are segregated. They cannot. A juvenile cannot be. Yes, I knew that. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. I know they're segregated and everything else, but they may be there versus a juvenile facility. Once they've been direct filed, then they will be moved from the juvenile detention center to the Leon County Jail in our circumstance and held there, which, again, the jail then segregates them from the adult population. Okay. And this is a big question to ask you to be very short on because I would like the chairman to be able to move on. Not at all. But I hear what you're saying about preempting your authority. I see we're one of three states that doesn't have the judge involved. Is there a gray area here in your opinion? I mean, there seems like there, from my reading of the material, and I knew that the state's attorney were not in favor of this, that there are cases where other voices might be in this mix, that there are other ways to handle this, maybe not the statute you mentioned, but is there another approach that you would recommend versus all in the hands of the state's attorney or everything that is being proposed in the resolution? Candidly, Commissioner, you don't, no offense, this body does not have the power 
to change the entire system. No, no offense. Agreed. So what's been proposed to you is making a recommendation that, so if I were Lord for a day and took over the Florida legislature, well, then perhaps I could rewrite the entire criminal justice code, and we might do a lot of different changes. I, I have to work within the law. I recognize that I am not a legislative branch. I'm an executive branch. So I'm going to follow the law as it's given to me. So for what I understand, the one revision that is being asked, I would suggest to you that, no, I don't, I, I don't think it should be changed. I believe, for the reasons I've articulated, that with this landscape the way it is, that this is the best. If you want to completely change the way the criminal justice, you want to change your age of majority and make 18-year-olds 24 and make that to the voting age, then we can start talking about what we need to do. I, I'm, I mean, that gets pretty broad, but I if that makes sense, it's, it's, it's very difficult for... One thing I know about the law is if you change something over here, you are going to have consequences over there. I'm telling you as a practitioner of criminal prosecutions in this community that what seems like a very reasonable and uh, holistic and uh, suggestion, of course nobody wants to have juveniles in jails. I can't disagree with that. I don't want to have juveniles in jails either. I also hate chemotherapy, but as long as there's cancer, we're going to need strong interventions for that disease. And I'm telling you, as long as we have severe crimes being committed by people less than 18 years of age, I'm going to need some severe consequences to be able to make the, in the interventions necessary to make this community safe. I wish I didn't have that problem, but the fact of the matter is we do have people who are being severely victimized, and we have offenders who will not be made well safe prior to the expiration of the juvenile uh, statutory ages. Thank you. I wish we had more time. I'll turn it back over. Um, one thing that I'm, I'm not sure I would like to get into more later. Um, if you have, Commissioner I, Dozier, if you, I mean, he's not going to be here later, so if you have more conversation, I'm not, I'm not bound. No, sir. I, I believe we have other speakers and other material and agenda mm -hmm. items, so I just thought placing it in the appropriate agenda. And okay. um, there's uh, a lot of different perspectives on this. I very much respect your perspective and um, the hard job you have. Um, it just seems like we are not just talking about 17 plus who commit murder or other heinous crimes. There is a diversity and um, this is complicated as you say. I wish there was more movement on the state end but um, I, am, I am concerned about what I've learned with direct file. I'm letting you know that, Mr. State Attorney, just, you know, um, and thank you for being here today. So thank you very much, ma'am. Thanks. Commissioner Lowe's. I just want to weigh in and support a Jack. I mean, appreciate you coming down, too. It, um, I, I'm not an attorney. I'm not going to ask to do your job. You're elected just like we are. Frankly, I think his comment about home rule and preemption and kind of staying in our swim lanes, to me, resonates because I think I don't know enough about all the nuances, and it sounds like he's got some latitude and I don't want to bend and change the way he does his job based on public opinion. I can appreciate Commissioner Proctor's comments, but I'm not sure this would in any way solve what he's trying to get to. That's a bigger, as, as the state attorney pointed out, systemic problem. But I and my, you know, uh, confidence is him and is in Jack to do the job he's been elected to do. And frankly, I think I'd like to leave things the way they are. It's a resolution, so we're not going to change the world with this in any case. But thanks. Thank you, Mr. K Mr. Uh, attorney, you have anything else? State attorney? No, no. You can call me Jack. I'm fine. Thank you very much, <laughs> Mr. Maddox. I'm fine. Hey. All right. Thank you all. Thank you. I almost called him Mr. County Attorney. I'm sorry. Her. There's no resemblance there, except for the hair thing. <laughs> all right. Um, we'll move on to the agenda now. We have awards and presentations. First award and presentation will come from myself, a proclamation recognizing the retirement of William Jerome Swint after 35 years of service. Uh, from there, we'll go to a proclamation. Proclamation reads, whereas William Jerome Swint began what became a long and beneficial career at the Leon County Public Library on October 1st, 1983, 
and whereas he began his library career at the Northwood Mall location and worked there from 1983 to 1991 and assisted in the move to the downtown main library in 1990, 1991. And in 1994 was promoted to senior library assistant. And whereas William is well known for his hard work and willingness to assist his fellow co-workers, and whereas William has been a dedicated employee serving the, the citizens of Leon County and willing to do whatever it takes to complete the mission at hand. And whereas over his career, he has worked in support services, collection management, and processed approximately 17,000 print items and 2,000 media items, effected repairs on over 1,000 library items, and withdrew countless numbers of materials, not to mention making over 3,000 3, pots of coffee for his co-workers. <laughs> How important is that, right? And whereas he has been a dedicated library employee serving the citizens of Leon County, use, and the citizens and library users of Leon County with his uh, expediting of all library materials to the community and his service to the library staff. And whereas William has served Leon County citizens with integrity, respect, stewardship, and accountability while demonstrating at all times the practice of people focused and performance driven. And whereas William Jerome Swintz, steadfast and hard work, uh, steadfast and hard work is being rewarded with a well earned retirement. Whereas William will enter the life of leisure with over 35 years of committed service to reflect upon. And now therefore, now therefore, we the Leon County Board of County Commissioners uh, do honor Mr. William Jerome Swint uh, on this day, October 23rd for his retirement. This is signed by myself as well as the rest of the commission attested to by the County Administrator. Ms. Swint, congratulations. Mr. Vice Chair, what's next? Next. We will recognize the distinguished service uh, by proclamation of Tony Parks, 38 years of service to Leon County. Come on down, Tony. No, you Real quick, Mr. Vice Chair, the uh, gender reads that I will be given the proclamation, but me being a former uh, athlete ha that has been coached before, uh, I thought this would be a special moment to let one of his own players give a proclamation at his retirement. And as you all know, Commissioner Daly refers to uh, Coach Parks as coach. So, Commissioner Daly, you have the floor. Sounds great. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to invite, uh, if we could do this in some unorderly fashion, any member of Public Works that's here that wants to come forward and come join Wrap your arms around Coach Parks. Come on down. Come on down. Come on down. Just fill in where you can. Come on, y'all. Come on back. Come on. Just fill in where you can. On behalf of the Leon County Commission, I have a proclamation to read. We're going to make this? <laughs> Whereas Tony Park began his employment with Leon County on December 3rd, 1979 as an engineer for the Department of Public Works Division of Engineering, 
And whereas Tony's knowledge, ability to solve problems and work with people led him to advance through his career, starting as Chief of Engineering Design to Director of Engineering Services and Director of Public Works. And whereas Tony retired on June 12, 2015, but his love and dedication to Leon County wouldn't let him stay gone for too long as he returned to the county to continue his service as Director of Public Works on January 4, 2016. And whereas Tony is well known and respected by his supervisors, employees, peers, and the citizens of Leon County for his calm, kind-hearted demeanor, historical knowledge of Leon County's roadways, stormwater systems, park facilities, fleet, solid waste facilities, his teamwork and willingness to assist his employees and fellow co-workers. And whereas over the course of his career, Tony has worked for nearly 38 years within the Department of Public Works and has been the primary overseer of numerous projects throughout Leon County, including the Safe Roads Program, the Two Thirds Program, Miccosukee Road Widening Project, Hall Landing Project, Orange Avenue Widening Project, Capital Circle Widening Project, Buck Lake Road, Lake Munson Restoration, Woodville Park, Timberlake Stormwater Enhancement Project, Appalachia Regional Park Improvements, Chairs Park, J. Lee Voss Park, Co Landing Park, Pedrick Pond Walking Trail. And whereas Tony was recognized by the Florida Chapter of the American Public Works Association as the 2017 County Public Works Director of the Year for outstanding service to the public works profession, and whereas Tony's vanilla wafer cake has proven to be the best dessert <laughs> made by a Leon County employee, boasting top prizes in the annual Taste Buds Challenge, and whereas Tony will now be able to devote all of his time to his family in babysitting his two grandsons and can officially eliminate Sunday drives after church inspecting retention ponds and other county projects, and whereas Tony Park will enter the life of leisure on October 12, 2018 with 38 years of committed service to reflect upon. And now, therefore, I, Nick Maddox, as the chairman of the county, Leon County Commission, do honor Mr. Tony Park, professional engineer, this day, 23rd of October, 2018, signed by uh, Chairman Maddox, uh, the vice chairman, all of the county commissioners, and county administrator, Vince Long. Coach Tony Park, you're an amazing man. Congratulations. Commissioners, Vince, uh, very thankful for the proclamation for the afternoon. I'm just thankful for God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit that planted me here in Leon County back in 1979. It's been fantastic, just fantastic. And um, I want to thank the commissioners for the opportunity and the privilege to serve the community, the citizens of Leon County. And I've been here long enough to see 29 county commissioners serve. How's your favorite? <laughs> you were my favorite left-hand pitcher. <laughs> I played you every game. And I want to thank Vince and Alan and Ken um, for allowing me to be a part of Leon County family and them giving me the second opportunity to come back and be able to get elected to be the uh, APWA County Director of Public Works for 2017. And I appreciate that and all the support that you've given me during my time here. I appreciate Herb and the County Attorney's Office and all that they did to support um, those uh, issues that I faced during the 38 years and always there to keep me out of trouble. I really appreciate that. I'm very thankful to all my co-workers in all the other departments and divisions outside of public works. Uh, it was always great to have such a team throughout the Leon County organization. And my biggest thanks goes to all my co-workers of public works.
past and present. I didn't accomplish anything without you. Your support and your friendship, and especially during a very difficult time when I, my wife passed away. I really appreciate that. And my greatest thanks is to my home family who supported my career through their sacrifice of allowing me to, to serve the community and the citizens and what they gave up when I was working extra hours and being a part of the community. Just so you know, one of the, a good friend of mine sent me an email to remind me that I'm not retiring, I'm refocusing. <laughs> I'm refocusing. And it's going to be with kids, grandkids, and friends. And I'm looking forward to getting back to the Public Works Department when we have our Thanksgiving lunch and our Christmas lunch and just coming by and seeing each one. But I've been very fortunate to be in a community. I love this community. I love to serve the citizens of this community. And I will be doing that even in my extra time of refocus. But thank you very much. Uh, commissioner comments. I see that um, Commissioner Dozier wanted to say something. And anyone else? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, maybe I should go later before Mr. Mr. Park slips away too much. Um, as someone else who gets choked up every now and then Great at commission job. meetings, you got me, Tony. Um, and all your folks are busily going back to work right now. Um, there are so many things we could say, but reflecting on the weeks that we've had recently and the efforts that your entire team, our county family, will talk more about this, but your folks uh, spending the night away from their families so they can respond quicker, things like that. The public knows how much you all do, but I don't think they see everything. And your legacy is the team. Um, a manager, a director who understands you don't do it alone, builds that incredible team. And it will, I think, outlast all of us, maybe another 26, 29 commissioners. We'll see. Enjoy your refocus. My favorite, one of my favorite pictures ever is uh, you ziplining on your last refocus time. So we look forward to seeing where Tony gets off to in your adventures. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Comments. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vice Chair. Tony, listen, I just want to say thanks. I mean, I, I feel like I kind of grew up in this job, and you you have had my back the whole time. I mean, everybody in public works really make us all up here look so good. But it, there was a great story when I first got elected. Um, we did the uh, sewer conversion out in Killarne Lakes. We had 1,100 homes that got sewer put in. A lot of people weren't real happy, and my I inherited that as I walked in the door. And uh, I'm a new commissioner, and I said, we, we need to have a town hall. We need to get in front of this and talk to everybody. And I'll never forget, Tony, you looked at me and goes, I don't think that's a really good idea. <laughs> and, and, and we went out there to Killarne, and you know the Blues Brothers where they're behind chicken wire and they get bottles thrown at them when they're trying to do rawhide? That was three hours of town hall. And Tony... You have been a rock star, and I have wa I have seen you walk into uh, citizen meetings where they wanted to rip my head off over whatever the issue was, and you've got the best demeanor and the most calming way of approaching it, and you have walked me through the toughest times, and I am very appreciative. Thank you. So, Mr. Well, Vice Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that Tony uh, really captures for me the. Uh, oh, 
Sorry. The manager who uh, is a professional, and I think that the award that uh, he garnered in 2017 speaks to what his colleagues and peers saw um, as a the professional's profession. Um, he has created a sense of um, endearment and has created a compassionate tone uh, in his relation in work and service and understanding the um, component parts in, uh, of people's lives uh, and the challenges that people bring to work with them and the empathy of uh, working with people to secure their very best um, and, 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 and being flexible uh, to secure their best. I think that few have done that better, Tony. Uh, this department is the, the area of the county that handles the grungy, uh, the dirty, the grinding, uh, put out the fire stuff. Uh, when waters overflow, uh, when sewer spills, um, when roads got holes in them, um, we turn to you. And one of the things that I've noted over the years uh, that you're Mr. Smooth, cool, and calm. The temperament remains the same regardless of how severe the storm may be. Be it category four storm, three, two, it don't matter. He's always been the same. So as you uh, refocus, um, I uh, salute you on what I've observed to be a very stellar career. And you note that by the um, energies of the people who are always with you, uh, great morale, and, that, and you see it every time we go to have dinner uh, at your place, um, Thanksgiving and Christmas, there's high energy, uh, there's love, um, there's camaraderie. And I think that that's a great tribute and expression to what your leadership has wrought and imbued in the organization. So Godspeed. Bless you, Tony. Thank you, Commissioner Proctor. Commissioner Lilly. I have a funny feeling that unlike some of us up here, you're exceedingly uncomfortable with having all this praise heaped on you. <laughs> but um, Well, wait a minute. I think. I'm, I I'm, on, I'm, only, I'm running for election, and you can praise me. <laughs> <laughs> that was my point. <laughs> I'll take it. John, you'll take a look at it. Um, it's so, it's so interesting. I mean, the world is so full of people who are skeptical and cynical about government at any level. You know, some of it's deserved, but I think they've never known Tony Park. And uh, such a pleasure to work with you over these years. From the, I think about the first week I was on the commission, and you took me on a ride in your pickup truck. And there's nothing I like more <laughs> than that to show me around the different parts of the county. I think we just got about half of it covered and uh, came back. But... Thank you so much for everything you do. The leadership, um, the uh, public works team is just heroic day in and day out. And I appreciate everything you've done. And it's just such an honor for me to have worked with you these past six years. Have a great retirement. And I'll see you at lunch on Thanksgiving or the day before. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Vice Chair. Uh, um, as the newest county commissioner, my uh, welcome to Tony uh, Park moment was um, through the legend uh, Jane Sauls. She said, you got to come to the employee Thanksgiving dinner and you got to bring some money to bid on Tony's cake. <laughs> so silly me, I stopped by the ATM and pick up a hundred bucks, <clears throat> thinking that that was going to be enough to snag the cake. Well, I quickly fall out at a hundred and I'm looking around the room to see if there's anyone in there I can borrow 20 from <laughs> to stay in the contest. So needless to say, I was outbid on that day. But again, your commitment and, and your uh, availability uh, at all times. We had a great conversation, uh, and I recall it at a friend's uh, funeral service um, vividly. And uh, and uh, the, the job you've done and, and the work that you've done um, uh, just speaks for itself. And uh, I'm excited to have known you even for a short period of time. Thank you for your years of service. Um, I'll let the county administrator speak. Commissioners, this is this is kind of a tough night for presentations, isn't it? It really is. On the agenda. Um, Tony, we're 
we're still all too sleep deprived from the storm to uh, to have this on the agenda tonight. Okay, it's a little a little too emotional, but uh, commissioners, you all know, and I think anybody that's been associated with the county knows that Tony's been so much more than the public works director here. He really has been the the embodiment of, of what it is to uh, be a county employee. And Tony, uh, for the sake of time here, just thank you for making us all better for so many years. Appreciate you. Tony, I'll be brief, man. I wanted to talk a little bit just about the culture you created. And it was visible um, when when you were on the podium a second at the podium a second ago and Commissioner Daly, before he um, presented your proclamation, tried to get all the guys to come up. Uh, is that kind of of humility that you promoted within your staff that really were the hands in the in, in the the feet behind everything great that happens in Leon County. Uh, a lot of people give us a lot of credit up, credit up here and think that that we create the policy. But but Gary Yorn told me something when I was first elected. He said, Nick, what people are, will be most concerned about is if their trash is picked up, if their streets are clean, if their lights can turn on, which we, which we have no control over. I don't know why he told me that. Um, and uh, <laughs> if. If their if if their uh, if their streets don't have potholes in them, and those were the things that that your staff takes care of, and and they do it like I said in a very humble way. I think um, a testament just to to how great you are is just how how complimentary every everyone in town was about how we got through uh, Hurricane Michael, and and the compliments I got on Facebook and in person about how professional your staff was and how responsive they were to the needs in this county and to, to making sure everything was cleaned up and, and making sure that our roles were clear. Um, I'm hoping that that, that, that 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 level and that culture of humility will continue with public works. It's one of the, one of the things I enjoy most about coming over to, uh, to have dinner with you guys uh, is, is, is the camaraderie and just the humility amongst those guys just to be friends with each other and have a good time with each other and to look at us, even when we come over, is hey, we might be commissioners on this dais, but you're just Nick when you walk in that door. And I always felt that way when I came there. And so I appreciate that that culture that you built, that you built over a 38 year span of being here in Leon County. As Vince says, you are the embodiment embodiment of what we should be as commissioners, but uh, what also our, our Leon County employees should be as well. And finally, my uh, chief of staff, Kathy Jones, will have an opportunity to win a bait contest in Leon County. <laughs> Um, she told me today uh, that she was very excited for that reason alone. I don't, I'm, the last thing I will tell you is that she has held against you for years now that when we had the last bait contest out at um, the county picnic that you won and she didn't. So she said she will finally let that go because you're transitioning and she'll have a chance to win. So you cannot participate anymore in any of our bait contests. But Tony, enjoy your retirement and we appreciate the, um, the work that you put in here. Leon County. Thank you. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> I tell you what, this is this is one of the this is one of the meetings that that you kind of is bittersweet because we ha we talk about transition, we talk about a changing of the guard here in Leon County. We just uh, sent off 38 years of experience into retirement. And now we're about to present a proclamation to 12 years of experience on this board. Uh, Vince, you and I will go down now to present a proclamation to Commissioner John Daly for his years of service here in Leon County. Commissioner Daly, come down. Daly, come here. I almost let Vince pre present this proclamation, uh, but different than um, John being uh, <laughs> being uh, a player for Coach Parks, Vince was Vince. Vince was John's drinking buddy. I didn't want the story. <laughs> <laughs> well, Stories from college to come out, so I'll just present this one. You know, it was at the same time. It was in tw we were twelve. Oh, you were twelve. Okay, okay. <laughs> Proclamation reads, whereas Commissioner John E. Daly was first elected to the Leon County Board of County Commissioners in 2006 and faithfully served the citizens of District 3 for 12 years, and whereas Commissioner Daly served as chairman of the board twice and most recently in 2017, 
during which Leon County was struck by Hurricane Irma. And whereas in 2008, Commissioner Daly had the foresight to propose the establishment of a catastrophic reserve fund, which allowed the a catastrophe reserve fund, which allowed the county to immediately address impacts of the storm without leaving, without having to wait for federal assistance. And whereas during Commissioner Daly's tenure, Direct uh, District 3 saw significant new improvements and investments in the community, including enhancements to the Tower Road Park, uh, Stoneler Road Park, uh, Okolotny, okay. mm -hmm. Okohipi, uh, Prairie Park, Jackson View Boat Landing, uh, Canopy Oaks Park, J. Lee Voss Park in the opening of both Orchard Pond Trail and Fred George Greenway and Park. And whereas Commissioner Daly first Commissioner Daly's first year in office commenced with the purchase of the land for Fred George Greenway and Park, and during his final term, the park was home to the Tallahassee, Leon, Bay Ruth, 15 and under, all-star all all -star game winners of the 2018 uh, Bay Ruth World Series. And whereas Commissioner Daly proposed the establishment of the North Monroe Corridor Task Force, whose work has resulted in several current and plan projects to beautify the corridor, improve transportation, enhance parks, trails, and sidewalks. And whereas Commissioner Daly championed the redevelopment of the late Jackson Town Center at Huntington, formerly Huntington Oaks Plaza, to house the expanded late Jackson Branch Library and new community center, which has grown to be a hub for District 3. And whereas Commissioner Daly has ardently, ardently uh, supported the preservation of Lake Jackson, a valuable biological, aesthetic, and recreational resource of not only Leon County, but the state of Florida. And whereas Commissioner Daly has been an unwavering advocate for Leon County staff who in his final term supported the adoption of a paid parental leave policy, the establishment of a $12 living wage for all employees, and in the implementation of a gender-based pay equity study. And whereas Leon County owes a debt of gratitude to Commissioner Daly for his years of service, now therefore be resolved that the Leon County Board of County Commissioners does hereby honor Commissioner John E. Daly for his public service and the impact he has left upon District 3 and Leon County as a whole. Just signed by myself as well as the Vice Chair, the rest of the Commission, and attested to by the County Administrator. Like I said, Commissioner, it's a tough night under presentations. Um, I, I told the chairman I'd come down and help him uh, with, with, a, with a part of this presentation. I'll, I'll do that. But I need to tell you, Commissioners, I told Commissioner Daly that I wouldn't do anything to embarrass him tonight. So I want you to mark your calendars for the upcoming <laughs> Employee Awards Banquet, which is happening in just a couple of weeks, where we're going to take a little more time uh, to recognize uh, John's uh, many years of dedication and service to Leon County, and I make no such promises uh, for that day, Commissioners. Um, but, but while I am here, and I, and I will, uh, Commissioner Daly, uh, keep it short and sweet like you asked me to, uh, and just tell you what, I, I do have the, um, the, the burden of, of expressing to you um, uh, in this very brief time that we have here today uh, the, the deep uh, and sincere appreciation and gratitude. Um, uh, on behalf of all Leon County employees. Uh, and I wanted to do that. Um, not only everything you've done, uh, but how you've done it with insight and intellect and heart and humor. Uh, we'll never forget you. And um, we want to make sure that you don't forget us, too. So uh, we heard that you might be decorating a new office soon. <laughs> um, and so Matt is going to come down. We didn't have oh a... Goodness. Uh, a, 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 a tripod strong enough to hold this, so, so we get Matt here to do so. And is that, is that Lake Jackson? This is Lake Jackson. We wanted to find something, Commissioner, near and dear to your heart. So this is a, a photo uh, of Lake Jackson. Again, when you look at it in your new office, which may be located in close proximity to this courthouse, 
very soon. You can think about us and your time here. Uh, again, we'll be thinking about you, and certainly the citizens of Leon County uh, will benefit from your time spent here for generations to come. And, and, and also, if you look at this picture, commissioners, uh, depending on how you'd like to interpret it, it could be a sunset or a sunrise, right? I could tell you how I feel about it. But, but, uh, but anyway, thank you, John. Appreciate it. One more time. We have a lot of work to do, so I'm not going to take up too much time. Uh, to quote the great Tony Park, I'm not retiring, I'm just refocusing. <laughs> <laughs> Look, this is how it's supposed to work. We get elected, we come in, we do good work, and there's a time for all of us to move on. I'm thoroughly excited about the next chapter of my life and moving forward, but I want to thank the citizens of District 3 for giving me an incredible opportunity to represent a wonderful part of Leon County and all the citizens giving me the opportunity to be on the County Commission. My family's been absolutely fantastic, and I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, comments? Is this the, a roast or a toast? <laughs> I believe it's a toast. There'll be a roast from what I've been saying. <laughs> if this is a toast, let me get my cup. <laughs> I would imagine that if any commissioners want to speak, we can save them before the end of the meeting. Do we uh, get another, uh, another round to? Yeah. Okay, we At the end of the meeting, we'll, we'll definitely do that again. Commissioner Daly, thank you for your leadership and for serving. Uh, it's been a pleasure for me to serve with you. I'm sure the rest of us can say the same later. We move now to a proclamation for uh, the 2018 Women Business uh, Enterprise of the Year. Uh, this proclamation will be presented to Ms. Kay Stevenson. Steves? Proclamation reads, whereas the first week of October has been designated as Minority Enterprise Development Week since 1983 by the President of the United States and observed by the Big Ben Minority uh, Enterprise Development Med Week uh, Committee, and whereas our community and local, in, uh, local economy has been enriched and well, well served by the goods and services provided by minority and women-owned businesses, and whereas the Big Ben Med Week Committee is a local consortium of agencies operating in our business in our business in our business and entrepreneurial ecosystem that uh, include the Tallahassee Leon County Office of Economic Vitality, the Florida State University Office of Supplier Diversity, Leon County Schools, the Florida Office of Supplier Diversity, the Florida A and M University Small Business Development Center, Talpin Electric, uh, and whereas an important activity of the annual Med Week observance is the selection of a prominent woman entrepreneur for recognition as the women's as the Women Business Enterprise WBE of the Year and the Med Week Committee is proud to have selected Ms. Kay Stevenson of Datamax as this year's WEB of the Year. And whereas Kay Stevenson has nearly 30 years of experience in the criminal justice uh, information sharing industry as co-founder, president, and CEO of Datamax Group Incorporated, Datamax headquartered in Tallahassee, Florida, one of the largest providers of advanced communications, advanced communications, data access, information sharing, enterprise intelligence, and access control solutions to the, to the law enforcement, criminal justice, public safety, and security industries. And whereas with more than 750,000 end users worldwide, worldwide, Datamax provides technology solutions to more than 70% of the 
of the criminal justice information market with such distinguished customers as the Federal Bureau of Investigations and United States Department of State. And whereas Ms. Stevenson currently serves as the executive committee on the executive committee of the Integrated Justice Information Systems, IJIS, Institute Board of Directors, the Board of Trustees for Florida State University Research Foundation, and Advisory Board to the Florida State University Computer Science De Department. And she is an active member of Women in Homeland Security and, Infra and InfraGuard, two uh, critical programs that support and further and further the protection of the nation's infrastructures and national security. And whereas Ms. Stevenson is also active in our community where she served for eight years on the board of directors for the Tallahassee Leon County uh, Council on Culture and Arts, including serving as chairman, as chairman, as chairwoman, uh, and also serving as serving a full term on the United Way of the Big Bend Board and the Tallahassee Leon County uh, Economic Development Council. Now, therefore, be it, resolved, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners of Leon County, and Leon County hereby recognizes Kay Stevenson and Datamax as the 2018 Women Business Enterprise of the Year. This is signed by myself as well as the uh, Vice Chair and attested to by the County Administrator. Ms. Stevens, congratulations. On behalf of the Datamax team, I'd really can't tell you how much I, we appreciate this proclamation from Leon County. Uh, it's very easy, okay, to do what we do because we all love what we do. So we don't really feel like it's work. It's a passion for us. And we appreciate the recognition that we get, especially when it's from our hometown. So thank you on behalf of all of us. All right, uh, Mr. Vice Chair, I believe this is the final proclamation, correct? That's right. All right. The final proclamation goes to our Minority Business Enterprise of the Year. Will Mr. Vince Raffington please stand, step forward? What's up, brother? Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. The proclamation reads, whereas the first week of October has, a designation, has been designated as Minority Enterprise Development Week since 1983 by the President of the United States and observed by the Big Ben Minority Enterprise Development Med Week Committee, and whereas our, our, community, our community and local economy has been enriched and well served by the goods and services provided by minority and women-owned businesses, and whereas the Big Ben Med Week Committee is a local consortium of agencies uh, operating in our business and entrepreneur ecosystem that includes the Tallahassee Leon County Office of Economic Vitality, the Florida State University Office of Supplier Diversity, Leon County Schools, the Florida, the Florida Office of Supplier Diversity, the Florida A&M University S Small Business Development Center, and Tal Quinn Electric. And whereas an important activity of the annual Med Week observance is the selection of a prominent entrepreneur for recognition as the Minority Business Enterprise MBE of the Year. And the Med Week Committee is proud to have selected Mr. Vince Raffington, a foremost by Vince as this year's MBE of the Year. And whereas Vince Raffington is the owner and CEO of Formals by Vince, uh, a Tallahassee uh, mainstay since 2010 that has long been recognized in Tallahassee and the surrounding area, area for providing classic and contemporary Formal wear, and whereas Mr. Raffington began his career in men's formal wear in 1986 under uh, Sassino's uh, formal wear in St. Petersburg, Florida, and moved his family, his family to Tallahassee to the Tallahassee area in 1990 as part of Sassino's uh, formal wear family, where he and his staff have uh, outfitted thousands of customers over uh, the, over his 30-year career in formal wear in the formal wear industry. 
And whereas in 2010, Mr. Raffington seized the opportunity to control his future and became owner of Formos by Vince. And whereas Formos by Vince provides a diverse array of tuxedo, tuxedo offerings from the world's best designers and serves the community by providing tuxedos by many, uh, to many worthwhile organizations in the area, such as graduating seniors at Gresham Everhart School, to young men at Boyce Town, North Florida, and by working closely with the young men preparing for Tallahassee Links Battalion uh, by providing hands-on uh, instruction on how to tie a bow, uh, how, how to tie bow ties and other formal wear skills as a part of enriching their preparation for life. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Board of County Commissioners in Leon County, Florida, that Leon County hereby recognizes Vince Raffington and formals by Vince as the 2018 Minority Business uh, Enterprise of the Year, signed by myself as well as the Vice Chair and all the commission and attested to by the County Administrator. Well, I'll keep it short so we can get on. Uh, thank you. It's been my pleasure uh, to serve each and every one of you uh, in some kind of way, be it uh, the commissioner, be it the governor, be it uh, your kids, uh, no matter uh, what grade. Uh, thank you, and God bless. Uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, if I, if I may, uh, I've been with Vince Raffington and Cino's formal well, formal wear, and I began with Vince about maybe 45 pounds ago, and uh, you know I was multiple sizes different uh, when I first started with Vince, but um, I, I can say that as recent as. Uh, my last trip to the Congressional Black Caucus meeting, and uh, I had all of my my stuff in the suitcase. Then I forgot about the uh, the black tie uh, dinner on Saturday night, and I had all my stuff. And then I had to call Vince, and uh, and he said, "Don't worry, I got you." And um, he took care of me. And uh, from what from what you know popular opinion, I heard I was about the cleanest thing in the banquet. So, Vince, I want to thank you for making me look good so many times. And, uh, you know, brother don't look so good, and you, you help him out so much. We, we keep coming back to you, and we thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, Vince. Hey, man, I'm going to come see you. Man. You look pretty sharp in the suit you got on, suit you got on today. Commissioner Pryor said you act, you outfitted him, and I'm tired of him coming in trying to outdo me, so I'll be, heading, I'll be seeing you next week. <laughs> be seen next week. I, I, I think I'm going to need a tuxedo to outdo Commissioner Pratt. He's been bringing it hard these last couple of meetings. Uh, but thank you so much, Vince, and congratulations on your recognition, sir. You. Yes, sir. Vince is my secret weapon. I didn't want to tell you. <laughs> uh, what I, you know what? Without further, I do want to recognize the uh, former um, public defender and current public defender in the building today. Uh, Andy, you want to stand up? Amen. Thank you. Now we move on with the agenda. If I can find it. Oh, there it is. Now we have a presentation by the uh, status, I'm sorry, uh, a presentation by the Commission on Status of Women, Women and Girls. Um, Madam Chair. Yeah. Oh, how are you? The floor is yours. Okay. I would like to make mention that the chair of the, on the uh, Commission on the Status of Women and Girls is a proud member of LT Class 27, uh, the best class ever. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> and the big cheese, as I might say, is uh, big cheese as well. But we, Madam Cheese, uh, we expect you to come to the next <laughs> party. Yeah. Yes, I'll be there. Great, thank you. <laughs> Did that class have any swag? What? Well, there's three of us in the room. I would think so. Yeah, I think we, I think we, we have the numbers. A swag. <laughs> <laughs> right. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Chairman Maddox, commissioners, administrators, and the members of the audience. Uh, my name is Andrea Jones, and I'm the past vice chair for the Commission on, status, um, uh, Commission on the Status of Women and Girls. And I'm honored to stand before you on behalf of this commission. As many of you know, 
The CSWG is a Citizens Advisory Commission whose purpose is to promote awareness of issues pertaining to more than half of this, of this community and to serve in an advisory role uh, providing input to the county and city commission as needed. This advisory commission is composed of 21 volunteers and in this past year we have worked approximately 1,500 hours. Utilizing the work of the past commissioners and the, organiza the organizational structure was changed to better focus on the main issues that face women and girls in this community and to be more responsive to this commission as well as the city. These are the, the committees from our past year. And if you notice, the first three are the areas that we feel greatly affect a, a woman and girl's chance to survive and thrive. Within this report, the commission is honored to share the research and work that was conducted in the past year. This work is related to various issues affecting women and girls and the impact that it has on our community. As a follow-up to the 2014-2015 CSW published report and to the International Conversation on Sexual Violence, the CSWG hosted a hashtag MeToo community conversation and survey. It is through these, this conversation and data collection, this event has and will continue to help us understand sexual violence issues and how they impact women and girls. Stuck together. Community engagement and research will likewise to better understand economic insecurity for women in this area. The CSWG hosted a public hearing at the Jack McLean Community Center. At this public hearing, which Commissioner Daly uh, attended, uh, various economic issues and perspectives, perspectives were offered by uh, service providers as well as members of the community. Our collaborative e efforts with the Leon, I'm sorry, Tallahassee Leon Federal Credit Union as well as the Oasis Center for Women and Girls allowed for the presentation and collection of data related to the financial well-being of women. The strategic review update, uh, I want to thank Commissioner Dozier for her efforts. She, she uh, worked along with the other people in, on this one slide. And throughout the year, the CSWG has worked to accomplish the goals and initiatives established by this strategic planning work group. In summary, these initiatives focus on improving CSWG's ability to respond to ongoing and immediate issues, create a structure within the commission that ensures goals are accomplished, and the creation and adoption of a multi-year strategic plan. We wish to thank the members of that working group for their, for their efforts. Looking ahead, in 2019, we will have a, a second economic community, uh, economic event, and it's planned to discuss and raise awareness on, uh, on the area of economics. We also uh, expect to complete our three-year strategic plan. The new chair and vice chair, Gina Giacomo and Liz Jakubowski, are powerhouses, thank you, <laughs> in their respective fields and in the community. We are encouraged and look forward to the progress that will result under their leadership. We wish to thank Chairman Maddox and the city commissioners for their continued support. And uh, we also look forward to the acceptance of this report. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, she meant county commission. <laughs> it's all good. Uh, Commissioner Deloge and then Commissioner Doge. Commissioner Deloge. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Former Vice Chair, AGs, and appreciate you. And great spread in Tallahassee Magazine recently. Um, so, Thank you. We, this item is on consent, so we do not need a motion, is that correct? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, actually, Mr. Administrator, do we need a motion? Yes. I, I we do we need a motion because we put it off yeah. consent. Okay. So, I'll make a motion. Staff yeah. recommend. Recommendation. Um, thank you all. I know, I'm, Mr. Chair, all I wanted to do is we have a number of members of the Commission on Status Women and Girls here. 
um, in our incoming chair, Gina. So if you all want to wave, and Shelly Gomez, I know from Oasis, is uh, taken on this uh, commission as well as Oasis in the last year. And I'm really excited about the work you've done on the strategic plan and where we're going from here. So thank you very much. And I heard the candidates forum was great. And um, hope you enjoyed it, Commissioner Daly. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Uh, motion on the floor is for acceptance of uh, the report staff recommendation on item number one made by Commissioner Dozier, seconded by uh, Commissioner Lowe's. All those in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We'll move on now to consent. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Administrator, are there any items put on consent? We have two items pulled from consent. Those are items uh, number 14 and 17. Thank you. Can I have a motion for the remainder of the remainder of the has been moved by Commissioner DeLoe, seconded by Commissioner Dozier. All those in favor indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Item number 14, Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number 14 is the FY19 primary health care program agreements. Uh, we're happy to answer any questions you might have. This item was pulled by Commissioner Proctor. Commissioner Proctor? I believe we do have a, did you pull it for the speaker, Commissioner Brother? We have a speaker on the item. Sure, sure. I, I wanted to speak to it, but I can hear the speaker first. Um, Mr. Administrator? We have one speaker card, uh, Dr. Holyfield. Dr. Holyfield, name and address for the record, please, sir. Dr. Holofield, Longleaf Court may take slightly longer than three minutes. First of all, this is about health care, and we don't need to forget that there are 47,000 people in Leon County with no health insurance and that black, in, <clears throat> black infants continue to die disproportionately in Leon County. But that's not why I'm here. This is the one year anniversary of certain black people being banned from Big Ben Cares. Black people having the Tallahassee police called on them by Big Ben Cares. That includes me and Sylvia Hubbard, a 60-year-old great-grandmother. Friday, October 26, marks the one-year anniversary, uh, anniversary when the Tallahassee police was sent after me for attending, attending a ribbon cutting at Big Ben Cares. Now, they would never have done this to a white physician. It would have never happened. What did Big Ben Cares want these armed Tallahassee police to do to me? Did they want them to arrest me? Did they want them to beat me up? Or did they want them to shoot me? And then there's Tallahassee Memorial Hospital, all of which are mentioned in this item 14 agenda item. For 17 years, CMH would rather see a black person die rather than be admitted to the hospital a so-called non-profit hospital with a, with a sweetheart deal with the city. They control the city on land, the buildings, and everything inside the buildings for a dollar a year. They pay CEO, CEO Mark O'Brien more than $1.2 million a year while paying poverty level wages to janitors as low as nine twenty five an hour. They limit the number of patients in the family practice program on Medicaid. 
and see no patients in the internal medicine program. It's been administered by TMH partner, Southern Medical Group. They have a 20-member board of directors devoid of black women, poor people, or people who live on the South Side. They're spending a quarter of a billion dollars on profitable opera operating rooms that will have no benefit to health, health outcomes. Mad Dog Construction is well represented on their board. But let me tell you who isn't represented. <clears throat> they don't have a single black woman on their 20 member of board of directors. Despite all this infant mortality, maternal mortality in the black community, <clears throat> despite having seven white women on their board, <clears throat> they don't have a single black woman on their 20 member board of directors. About a minute. Sir? Just about a minute. About a minute? Yeah, about a minute. Yes, I'll sir. wrap it up. They have harmed the community for decades by handing out free infant formula in the hospital delivery bags, thereby undercutting, undercutting my efforts to promote breastfeeding, which saves the lives of infants. TMH forced Dr. Joseph Webster off the medical staff for no legitimate reason, no legitimate reason at all. And then there is FSU, which is an intimate relationship with both Big Bang Chaos and TMH. FSU attempted to place a polluting biomass plant right next to Sable Palm Elementary so that the overwhelming black, the overwhelmingly black kids could breathe the fumes. We stopped them. They tried to place a medical clinic right next to neighborhood medical clinic, clinic to drive it out of business. We stopped them. Now they are building a medical clinic next to Sable Palm Elementary School. At least this is better than a biomass plant. The white power structure will not be satisfied until both bond and neighborhood have been destroyed. And the health care of black people is entirely in the hands of powerful, a powerful chamber-led power structure that runs this town. town. And finally, there's Publix. There's Publix on Gaines Street. They refuse to sell tobacco products to the rich white FSU students in College Town. Yet they sell tobacco in black and many low-income communities. Tobacco kills 480,000 people in the U.S. alone and millions worldwide. This commission should tell publics that if they refuse to sell tobacco to rich white FSU college students in college town, they should not sell tobacco products anywhere. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Holyfield. Commissioner Proud, you have the floor. Thank you, commissioners. I uh, pulled this issue uh, in looking at some of the data tables and uh, considering the uh, need for mental health services that the collective investment from October 1, 2017 through July 31, 2018 was a grand huge sum of $170,000. I think that um, this is woefully inadequate to the, the known need uh, for mental health. But I, I am uh, heartened by, uh, in our notes, that 150000 Dollars, which in 2016 our board recommended and approved, was able to leverage uh, $1.5 million from the state to establish the central receiving facility, uh, their Appalachia campus. Uh, that's a 10 to 1 match. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, are we uh, doing the same thing? Are we anticipating... Uh, the same leveraging of, of, of 150,000 or 200,000 this year, uh, are we in line to, to repeat? I didn't see that forecast. Commissioners, the leveraging is still in place for another, uh, I think our commitment was for five years total, so we'll do the 150 again this year. 
Okay, so that will bring the same 1.5 million. I think some of that was one-time money originally, but our, our commitment was for five years. But overall, they'll still be leveraging funds. I don't know if it's still the full 1.5. That's your understanding, Shington. Okay, good, good. Um, I think that there's been a reticence on the part of this board to have a sit down and a constructive talk with the boards of neighborhood and bond. I don't know if uh, our board is afraid to um, s s use the word um, interfere, mess with, bother them because they're black. Uh, but there's been a failure on our part, and there is a need on our part to have a sit down talk with respect to these units leveraging these very limited and finite resources to uh, maximize service delivery uh, to their population. Uh, a few years ago, we tried to uh, get an exacting understanding of their numbers, uh, what they were doing. Uh, there was the issue of the federal uh, qualified status uh, being placed in um, suspension as it relates to bond. Um, I really don't know what that status is, if they're federally qualified uh, center or not. A report has never come back to our board. We give money silently and we put them on consent. And I don't think that our consenting this uh, it, it takes away the leverage, the oversight for the amount of money we got on the table uh, for making sure that there's a qualitative and excellent delivery of services. And I'm asking that next year that we not treat this as um, your annual um, contribution to the uh, um, um, United, United Way. You just write some a check and I've done my part. Uh, there has to be uh, oversight as ultimately we are in charge of the health, uh, safety, and welfare of our community. And this being the most vulnerable community that's being served, uh, we just need to man up and woman up with regard. And it needs to be a sit-down uh, situation of accountability um, that that shouldn't occur. And then... Um, the number of visits that have been reported at Shington, um, it's, it seems like uh, the neighborhood, I don't understand how the neighborhood is reporting their primary health visits at 4,175 and, and, and only 1,687 folk have visited Bond. Is that a like, was, are the numbers put on the wrong, I mean by the wrong, um, Provider, I, I, I didn't know that neighborhood was 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 seeing 4,100 people, and Bond was seeing merely 1,600 people. Commission, hey, those, those, table two, I'm looking at. Yeah, I'm looking at the table. Those are the numbers that he reported. As far as those are individuals that specifically met the criteria for receiving funds from the county. So these were individuals who are Leon County residents who are uninsured and who don't have, um, who are low income and meet the criteria for being a low income. So that doesn't mean that's all the clients that they saw, but for those that meet, meet our criteria, those are the individuals. Those are the visits, specific uh -huh. visits. And I'm, I'm just going off the top of my head and I want the commission to know that it's merely off the top of my head. Uh, when J.R. Richards was down there at Bond, uh, they were seeing uh, in the neighborhood between 14, 16, 7, 18,000 uh, visits. And to say that, uh, unless that number has dropped way down, I honestly don't believe that if they're anywhere near 15,000, uh, that only 1,600 of their uh would qualify in this category. And I, I have a problem, and I'm asking, uh, Mr. Chairman, if yes, this commission would permit, uh, there is a significantly higher walk-in, uh, more than 1,600 folk that went the bond. 
last year. Um, I think that, and I'm asking for the board to allow um, uh, Mr. Shington to go back and to secure the accurate number for something ain't right. This ain't right. And there is no way uh, that a uh, neighborhood has 4,100 people qualifying in this category and Bond ain't got but 1,687 people in this category. Um, I'm not that smart, but I'm, 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 you know, I, I just don't believe that this is accurate. The other, the other thing, Commissioner, um, neighborhood was the is currently the the larger F FQHC between neighborhood and Bond, and also they have a couple of different locations where they provide their services. Um, Bond's primary location is the area on South Gaston Street, um, but again, the the main part is that this does not reflect all the visits that they see. These are just those visits that meet our criteria as far as for our CareNet program. Yeah, I, is neighborhood in, also in Havana? Yes, they do have a location in Havana. Okay. What I'm trying to get at is that unless you're borrowing some numbers from Gadsden County, I don't think that they've outperformed uh, on that end of the community, the density of the community or that they're serving, the service area is more dense uh, where, where Bond is located than the area uh, over there by the, by the um, uh, Frenchtown area. I think that this needs to be looked at. But most of all, um, aside from that, there needs to be greater willingness as well as willfulness on this uh, board's uh, part to uh, bring both groups in to see how we can maximize their status as a federally qualified health providers in our community. Uh, the uh, primary, uh, the uh, mental health issue is uh, woefully not being addressed, uh, commensurate to the demand of people who they're seeing. And these numbers, again, are much too low for the population uh, that is walking through their doors. Um, the dental numbers are, I know dentistry numbers, they run out of money quickly. And I think the board is unaware of that demand in dentistry. And I'm asking Mr. Chairman that we would, um, some, sometime in the future uh, at the board's retreat at the Goodwood uh, Plantation that y'all would consider this year um, having a, a sit-down meeting with these entities. And, of course, as a comparison uh, for primary visits, I don't know how um, TMH um, is put in comparison uh, with a couple of these categories. Um, I don't know how TMH uh, is sitting there uh, on, a, on, a, on a page with neighborhood and bond in some of these categories. But I guess that they isolate uh, the pool of uh, secondary uh, patient recipients that they receive, either referred from Bond or referred from TMH. But it, it indicates that on, on Table 1, that um, category on the FY, uh, on the primary, that it represented the sum of Bond NMH and TMH request. And I didn't know that we were funding TMH request uh, for primary care. That's very confusing. But I'm saying to the board that um, these numbers, the graph, uh, it, it deserves a closer uh, walk with God and walk with these entities to, to maximize our results. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move this item with recommendations that we would uh, consider a sit-down meeting with the entities that are coming and as well as a request for data to be checked out by Shinkton. Thank you, sir. Motion been made by Commissioner Proctor, second by Commissioner Lowe's to move the item with recommendation that we have a sit down meeting meeting with the entities that provide care uh, that were mentioned in the item. Is that correct, Commissioner Proctor? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All those in favor of the motion on the floor indicate by saying aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We'll move on now to item number 17.
Commissioners, item number 17 is under status reports on the criminal history background checks and waiting periods for the purchase of firearms. Uh, again, we brought this uh, to you, commissioners, at your request for an update. Uh, this was pulled by Commissioner Lindley. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Commissioner? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, we're having such a run of good news here tonight for the most part that I just wanted to pull this item. Six months ago, we had, this chamber was completely packed uh, and standing room only out in the hallways, I think, as we discussed. The one thing local governments can do regarding uh, guns safety and gun sales, and we passed unanimously the uh, closing the gun show loophole for Leon County. Since that time, we our six-month report has, uh, we've had three gun shows at the fairgrounds and uh, ongoing sales at the, uh, uh, the what is it called, the, the show out there on the, the flea market show that they have every, week, every weekend. And we've had uh, absolutely no pushback at all. We've had um, no litigation, no challenges, no complaints to either the sheriff's office or code enforcement. And I just think it's interesting when, some, when we um, all get so uh, concerned that we are really going to just change the landscape of our community and uh, you either think things are going to get substantially better or substantially worse. And this ordinance has been in effect and has really gone uh, along very smoothly. And in fact, uh, the other day from some folks in Duval County who are, are wanting to uh, copy the Leon County ordinance and also try to make this one small measure for um, uh, stemming uh, gun violence uh, due to um, sales uh, for people who cannot pass background checks otherwise. So I just wanted to bring this to everyone's attention and um, be very happy to have this report, uh, which is very positive for our community, I think. With that, I would just like to move uh, option one, please. Option one has been moved by Commissioner Lindley. Is there a second to the motion? Seconded by Commissioner Dozier. All those in favor of the motion on the by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Mr. Administrator, are there any more items on consent that have been pulled for us to address? There are not. There are not. Uh, we are now on citizens to be heard on non-agenda items. As I'm, as I'm reading it, we have three cards from Mr. Britt. Mr. Britt, I'm going to meet you in the middle, if you don't mind, sir, and give you about three and a half minutes, maybe four. <laughs> first two and give me a little more on the last one. All right, we'll, we'll meet at five. My name is Mickey Britt. I reside at 4407 Millwood Lane, Tallahassee, Florida. Uh, my first one is uh, about voting rights of people. I personally am married to a, uh, a immigrant. She pays property taxes, abides by the law just like everybody has to do, but she don't have a right to vote. Legal immigrants that come into this country, they're expected to abide by the law. They should have a right to vote also. Illegals, nah. Kick them out. Kick them out. But the oxymoron of all oxymorons is whenever someone gets out of prison and has served their time and says they have paid their debt to society, but they can't vote. How the hell can you pay your debt and still not be a, a citizen. You no longer have a country. They live here. They have a right to vote. I'm through. Next subject. Talk about the VA. I had cancer. And I'm at the VA in Gainesville. And they give me uh, chemotherapy pills. It turned into going into my lungs, and I have to go back to Gainesville. And uh, they did some bronchoscopy, put me on oxygen, and I need treatment. I call my oncologist, who I fucked the world of, voicemail. That went on for a week, no call back. I finally go to the VA here and say, what the hell is going on? How come I can't get treatment? I need treatment. They called and got a hold of my oncologist. He was real nice. Said he would call me the next day. 
The next day, my house phone rang, and I'm on auction. By the time I got there, done hung up. So I called back over to the VA in Gainesville again. Voicemail. I told the doctor to kind of kiss my you-know-what. Twenty minutes later, the Tallahassee called me, and boy, they got that message. All them other messages they didn't get, but they got that one, let me tell you quickly. So I changed oncologist, got me a note. Later on, I uh, had to take some pills, and I guess it had affected me mentally. And I became suicidal, and we had gone to China, and I had to cancel and pay 600 bucks to come back early because it was bad. I wouldn't wish that on my worst enemy. I understand cancer, strokes, and everything else, but I don't understand this. So I go to the VA. They put me on pills that made me worse. Mr. Britt, so, three minutes is up. I'll give you another one. Go for it. You want me to stop? Keep going. I'll give you about 30 more seconds. About two minutes, one minute. One minute. I'll give you one minute. Okay. I was simply saying I called the VA to tell them I needed some help now. And they said uh, mental health. Couldn't get a hold of them with nobody. I called them and tell them I'm on the way there. I need help. They said we close at 4.30. I said, oh, me, I thought you closed at 5, but I'll be there. Tell mental health, do not leave. Don't go nowhere. I'm coming. I want some help. I got there in time. Go downstairs, and the little lady that works at Mental Health said, we're closed. We'll see you Monday. I said, I need some help now. We'll see you Monday. I said, you know what? I need some help now. They call security. I left, but I reported. That lady needs to be fired. She didn't care if I killed myself or didn't. Okay, I'm through. Now let me get to the... The one that's going to take you the longest time. No, no look, you got you, you, Listen, Mr. Brett, i tell you what. You had a you had a minute. I'm pretty sure that minute's up. It's about 5, it's about 4.45. I can't give it to you. You could see, come. See you two weeks from now. All right, all right, all right, all right. Mr. Brett, we'll see you in two weeks. Thank you, sir. Thank you for working with me. All right, um, we'll move on now to the uh, general business commission. Commissioners, what I like to do here is I like to go ahead and uh, modify the agenda a bit, move number 24 up, uh, since we've already had the conversation from the state attorney, and, and address that one first, and then go uh, back to 18 after. So I am no, is there any objection to that? Any objection? Seeing none, we'll go to item number 24, Mr. Administrator. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Item number 24 is the overview of the No, Ch no Place for a Child campaign and resolution. As you mentioned, the state attorney uh, was here and provided a brief presentation. Uh, again, this item provides an overview and seeks the board's uh, direction with regard to whether you'd like to support the attached resolution uh, to limit prosecution of minors as adults. We have about uh, five speaker cards, uh, Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Proctor. I'm sorry, we have Commissioner Proctor, would you like the speakers to speak first? Do you I'll, want to I'll defer to the speakers? Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Administrator, speakers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've got uh, Nancy Daniels to be followed by Andy Thomas. Uh, name and address, sir? Ms. Daniels had to leave. Uh, uh, in support, uh, Ms. Daniels speaks in support. Uh, Ms. Day, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Ms. Thomas, you want to speak? Uh, Ms. Public Defender? He actually knows the subject better than anyone. Okay, Mr. McCoy, come on up. If we could. Uh, name and address for the record, please. Sir, you have three minutes. As you can see, i am give you a couple minutes after, but a couple seconds after. Uh, I'll take it. Thank you, so. sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the time. Uh, my name is Scott McCoy. I'm the Senior Policy Counsel uh, for the Southern Poverty Law Center for Florida, and I'm based here in our Tallahassee office. I'm also a resident of Southwood and District 5. And I appreciate, uh, Commissioner Dozier, uh, bringing this before you. Um, we heard from, um, from the state attorney, and, and he was referencing that he had just been on a panel at the Florida Bar Criminal Justice Reform Summit, and I actually sat next to him on that panel. So we have been going round and round on this. And I just wanted to address a couple of things that he said. First of all, I just want to make clear that th this resolution is basically lending your voice to the conversation about this subject, right? We are fully aware that this is a resolution. We are not asking you 
to necessarily legislate anything on this, but this is still an important issue for the people of Leon County. And, um, and so the crux of this issue is, is not whether or not the state attorney necessarily has the power to direct file or not. The, the, the real issue here is what are the limits of that power and who is involved in the decision, the very, very important decision, perhaps one of the most important decisions that our criminal justice system makes of um, whether or not we prosecute a child as an adult in the adult system. Now, in, in my opinion, that decision should be a very difficult decision, and it should involve lots of people, and it should at least involve a judge. And unfortunately, Florida is one of, uh, of three states in the country that has a process that gives all of the power to the state attorney and gives unfettered discretion to that person uh, without any checks and balances from the judiciary. And the reform that is supported in the resolution is to create a fitness hearing, which is basically to involve a judge in the decision about whether to prosecute that child as an adult. Right now, the state attorney decides to prosecute a child as an adult, he files an information, off the kid goes to the adult court, and that door is, doesn't swing both ways. You go through that door and you're in adult court and there's no way to get back. And so what the reform that this resolution is, is, is supporting is one that simply says, after the state attorney has made the decision and used his or her discretion to prosecute the child as an adult, then at least let's give the child an opportunity to go to the adult court judge and say, wait a minute, um, I shouldn't be here. I should be in, in, in juvenile court again. So let's have a hearing. Let's look at the evidence. Look at my background, my family circumstances. And, and if, if the judge thinks that that is better to be dealt with in juvenile court, then you can send them back. Right now, there is no process that allows that. So we're not talking about, you know, uh, taking someone that's committed murder and then saying the state attorney can't prosecute them as adult. We're talking about, really, the 50% of kids that are direct filed who have committed nonviolent offenses. Of all the kids that are transferred to adult court, more than half of them are being transferred for nonviolent offenses. And there's just no way, no process for them to get back. And I think it would be better if we replicated the 47 other states in the country that have this very important due process for these kids rather than this out of balance system we have that is making it so that Florida prosecutors are sending more children to Florida adult courts than any other state in the country. That is essentially the crux of the resolution, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I have a question. Sure. Commissioner Potter. Thank you. Is there a competency component that uh, in some way evaluates uh, the 14-year-old, the 13-year-old child as to whether or not, how do you arrive at their weight of uh, being an adult? I mean, I guess intelligence is measured in terms of uh, uh, but is there any uh, testing uh, that the state attorney applies in helping to determine uh, the seniority of mind state of a child? Um, Commissioner Parker, that's an excellent question. And let me just talk about competency and then talk about an evaluation of mental development, maturity, and things like that. So there's the legal process of determining the competency of a child to essentially stand trial, if you will. And that's a very, it's a separate legal evaluation. And the question there is merely whether or not the child is competent to proceed. And whether that's in a juvenile setting or whether that's in, in an adult setting. Um, one of the reforms that's proposed up at the Hill often is to make crystal clear in statute that a child that has been deemed or found to be un incompetent should not be transferred for, to adult court. There's some ambiguity and dispute about that uh, right now uh, in the law. Um, but the question I think you're really focusing on is, is there an evaluation? Is there any time in the, any place in this process where someone sits down and, and really goes through what is this child's history, uh, hear from experts about the child's mental development? Because we all know that children don't fully develop their cognitive skills and literally their physical brain doesn't develop until even as late as fully until even as late as 25 years old. So when you're dealing with a 13 year old, a 14 year old, a 15 year old, um, that is a serious, serious, serious question. Um, 
Some state attorneys will, will take that into account when they're making decisions. But for the most part, there's no formalized process by which evidence is presented about an individual child to determine what exactly their level of maturity and mental development and cognitive, you know, uh, decision making skills are. But see, that and that and therein is the problem. Right now, all of that is in the hands of the state attorney. So even if you have a, you know, an attorney that, that is represented by a private counsel or even many that are represented by the public defenders, after that child is transferred to adult court, there's no opportunity for the child and the child's attorney to say to the judge, you know, let's hear from some experts, let's hear about an individualized determination and assessment of this kid. There's no opportunity for that. Now, the state attorney mentioned that, well, there's always a judge involved in the sentencing decision, right? Well, of course, when a child is transferred from, you know, to adult court and they go through trial, there's a sentencing phase, and that's absolutely right. But the problem is, is that at that point, you're not focused on the things, uh, Commissioner Proctor, that you were just highlighting. You're, the judge is looking at sentencing like, okay, what punishment am I going to give this kid? And you're right. The, the state attorney is right. Judges in some cases do have the ability to apply adult sanctions, but they never do. And that's mostly because adult court judges deal with adults and they deal with adult sanctions. They're not as familiar with the juvenile sanctions. And you'd be surprised to know that 70% of the kids that are transferred from juvenile to adult, 70% of those kids, the sanction the adult court ends up giving them is adult probation. Which begs the question, if we're talking about heinous crimes, the worst of the worst, why does the judge then, after having seen the case, say, I'm going to give you adult probation as a sanction? No jail time, adult probation. So, uh, why couldn't we keep that kid in the juvenile system and deal with him there? And the juvenile system is not perfect, but it is designed at least to try and rehabilitate kids. So you could keep them in the juvenile system where they get programming and their and education and they're ready to you know maybe get back on track. In the adult system, literally they are let go back into the community with a bunch of conditions that are hard for children to, to meet and to abide by. And many of those 70% actually end up going to prison, not for the underlying crime that they committed, but because of a violation of their probation. So this system is just simply not serving our kids the best that we could serve them. And again, we're not talking about saying no more direct file, no more discretion from the state attorney. Um, we're talking about improving the process by which we make the decision to prosecute a child as an adult. And I hope that answered your question. It was a long, long answer. It was. Um, <laughs> I said. I appreciate not. the chairman's discretion. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, Commissioner Pratt, you still have the floor. Well, actually, I have another speaker. How many speakers? There's uh, four more. Uh, Andy Johnson was up. Thank you, Andy. I'm sorry, Andy Thomas was up. There's Andy right. Johnson. He's sitting beside Thank Andy Johnson. That's a good name, too. No problem. Um, I just want to hit on a few points. Defenders? Number one, what Scott just said about uh, once they're in adult court, there's not much we can do. Well, what we do is we spend a lot of money, just like on a capital case, because we have social workers, psychologists that we pay for trying to convince circuit judges to impose juvenile sanctions. So this is a very costly process as well. I, that's something I want people to be aware of. Uh, speaking to the racial inequities, uh, Commissioner Proctor, in 2016-17, all offenses in the Second Judicial Circuit, there were 39 direct files, 32 of those individuals were African American. Okay, That is 82% of the direct files. Um, in a five-year period for burglary, which they say is the biggest crime that they direct file on, um, 40 of 44 over a five-year period were African Americans direct filed on. So that to go to that point, the statistics are more than justifiable for what you say. A couple of other things. If I'm charged with burglary as a child, then I can go to programs. I can have specialized, if I have special needs, they put me in a special commitment center, supposedly. It's a different issue. But if you put me on a score sheet, I score 20 months prison for one burglary of a dwelling, 15-year offense. Seventy percent of those kids are put on probation. About 80 percent of those kids violate because they don't know how to do adult probation. 
And what happens? They get that 20 months. They go to prison. That's the bottom of the guidelines. They're done. They're done. They're career criminals. I'm telling you that. You take a kid, you put them even in that detention center or put them in that jail, put them in solitary. Don't give them education for a while. Have them there a week or two. He's done. Close to done. But you put him in prison, it's over. Mm -hmm. You have just thrown that child away. And I think that's the point here. There is a more mindful way to approach our children. We're only one of 13 states that even allow the state to prosecute children as adults. So we're already an outlier. And then we're one of three that allow the state attorney to do it alone. I don't know. State attorneys change their mind with the political winds, too, don't they? So it might be really, really trendy right now since direct file is being criticized so much that we're doing a really careful review and we're just going after gangs and this and that. But what about the kid that's 12 years old that they need to testify against one of those adults in that gang? We'll direct file on him to put pressure on him. There are any number of tools of torture here that are involved in this. And so I would just uh, ask the, the commission to approve the resolution. Any, any type of momentum we can get in the legislature, we need because they ain't listening real well either. Okay, so we need all the help we can get. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Next speaker. Karen Woodall. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I'm Karen Woodall. I'm the executive director of the Florida Center for Fiscal and Economic Policy. I reside at 579 East Call Street here in Tallahassee. Um, I, too, want to thank uh, Commissioner Dozier for bringing this resolution forward. I'm here to speak in support of it and thank Commissioner Proctor for his excellent questions. Um, I want to share with you, because you've gotten the information and the facts from Mr. McCoy um, and from the, our public defender, I want to share with you the 29 statewide organizations that stand in support of this issue in the legislative process. Um, there are the Children's Campaign, Project on Accountable Justice, the James Madison Institute, the Southern Poverty Law Center, ACLU of Florida, Florida PTA, R Street, Campaign for Youth Justice, Families of Youth Incarcerated, Florida Children First, Florida Council of Churches, the Florida Juvenile Justice Association, Florida Legal Services, Escambia Youth Justice Coalition, Jacksonville Juvenile Justice Coalition, the National Congress of Black Women, the National Coalition of Jewish Women, Pace Center for Girls, Florida Immigrant Coalition, Farmworker Self-Help, New Florida Majority, Public Interest Law Section of the Florida Bar, the Florida Public Defender Association, the Center for Children's Rights, LULAC, Latino Justice, the League of Women Voters, the Florida Policy Institute, and as I said, the Florida Center for Fiscal and Economic Policy. It's a pretty broad base group of organizations that care about children, that work on juvenile justice, and that have been working with the legislative process to reform this issue. Um, I would submit to you, it's not a preemption issue. It's a due process issue. Many of us, myself included, were shocked to learn that there's not always an opportunity to make the case on both sides as to why particularly our children are being looked at as going into adult court. So I would urge you to support this resolution. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker. Kara Gross. Hi, thank you. Um, I'll be brief. I'm Kara Gross, the Legislative Counsel for the ACLU of Florida, and I want to thank you very much for considering this resolution. Uh, the ACLU of Florida strongly supports this resolution, and we hope you do too. Um, we are here today because we do not believe that children should be sent into the adult criminal justice system without first having a judicial hearing and a judicial determination about whether that course of action is appropriate. The decision to prosecute a child as an adult has severe and long-lasting, lifelong consequences and should be made by a judge. To be clear, the resolution does not provide that children should never be prosecuted as an adult. It merely seeks to ensure that a judge participates in that decision. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. 
Next speaker, uh, Denitza Koev. Kolev. Name and address for record, please, ma'am. Hi, my name is Denitza Kolev. I reside at 420 North Adams Street. I'm currently a third year law student here at FSU. I have um, worked at the Public Interest Law Clinic now for several years, working on various children's advocacy issues. And I'm currently working at the Children in uh, Prison Project, where most of our clients are in prison as, in, as a result to direct file. Um, one of those clients that I'm working with right now actually was sentenced to a four life sentence, um, four, four life sentences for a nonviolent crime that he committed when he was 14. Um, and he is still currently incarcerated almost 20 years later. And this wouldn't have been the case if there was judicial discretion. Um, I am, I've been living here in Tallahassee since 2012. I'm a registered voter of Leon County and I'm an active member of this community. There are a lot of things I love about living in Tallahassee, but um, I would be extremely proud to say that I live in a place that doesn't do this to our children. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker. Final speaker, Kaylee Lamphere waves uh, her time in support. All right, commissioners, I have Commissioner Prattner, Commissioner Dozier, in queue to speak. Commissioner Prattner. Commissioners, um, I would move option two, which places us in uh, the position that the speakers tonight who've come uh, speaking unique and distinct from the state's attorney. Uh, I will offer option two. I would like to comment if there is a second. Option two has been moved by Commissioner Prattner. Is there a second? Second. second. Uh, that motion has been seconded by Commissioner um, Dozier. Okay. Um, I have, I still wish to speak. Yes, sir. I just wanted to say briefly, commissioners, that a few years ago, it was very, very shameful that the United States Supreme Court, as conservative as our Supreme Court is, actually found that Florida uh, was in violation of the Eighth Amendment of the United States Constitution, inflicting cruel and unusual excessive punishment upon children who had been sentenced to life uh, sentences for uh, things that had occurred in their uh, juvenile years. Um, when the United States Supreme Court uh, overturns and remands cases to a state uh, in a whole class of cases, and if one of you lawyers, uh, uh, public defender, if you're familiar with that case, uh, I can't remember, but could, could you just give our commission a little history, just briefly? I think it's, I think it's Graham versus Florida, but is that right? It's basically just if if you received a life sentence, you have to be given an opportunity to show proof of rehabilitation. You can't functionally lock up someone who was a juvenile at the time of the offense without some review and, and some process. Okay. And we've done numerous resentencings around the state through all the different circuits, and many of them result in those people walking out of prison because they've been there so long. And they have rehabilitated themselves, much to my shock, in that environment that they have. Sure. And I, I just want to say that I'm reminded when I was listening to the speakers of the lady, the mother who was watching the, uh, the seventh grade band uh, perform um, halftime, and um, the band came off the field, and this excited mother, and she just stood up and just threw her hands in the air and said, the oh, whole band was marching wrong except my Johnny. And only a mother would see that the entire band was out of step except her Johnny. And when 47 states uh, are allowing for the uh, collaborative wisdom of a judge uh, to be a part of a consideration of whether to sanction a child as an adult, um, that the whole 47 states and only three members of the band are out of state, are out of step, does that suggest that 47 members of the band were stepping wrong? I'd like to believe that on this issue, uh, the three band members who ain't marching right, we're one of those, but let's try and correct that step and become consistent with the rest of the United States. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, sir. Commissioner Pro uh, I'm sorry. Commissioner Dozier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I will keep this short, although this is a deep conversation um, that I hope we will revisit at times. Thank you all for staying with this long couple hours we've gotten. We're just starting on general business, so 
appreciate that. Um, the only thing I want to say, Mr. Chair, because the state attorney spoke earlier and this is a little disjointed to me, and I think, Karen, you summed this up, I was surprised to learn there was no other way to deal with or, or to um, appeal um, or to get a competency hearing or anything else when a state attorney decides to direct file. It just seems like everything we've got this is a process question. There are checks and balances. Every issue is complicated. I do not want the state's attorney job. And Andy, I love you. I don't want the public defender's job either. I, the things that you all see on your desk is, it, it's got to be heartbreaking and you're trying to protect the community. And I respect that from uh, State Attorney Campbell's position. Um, this is not about trusting him. This is about getting a start on fixing something that we know better. Um, there is a better place for kids to be so that they do not slide down into recidivism and everything else, which, which ends up costing us all money, costing lives, everything else. So I appreciate the commission um, willing to look at this, and I'm glad we're doing this. It is just the start of a bigger conversation, part of our larger conversation, I think. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Dozier. I will be supporting the motion uh, on, on the floor. I, I'm, one of the most touching things I've ever watched on Netflix was the story of Khalif, Khalif Broder in New York, a um, young man who was incarcerated and charged as an adult and, and uh, went in with, with hope in his eyes and came out um, with just totally destroyed. The things that, was done, that were done there while he was in prison were uh, inhumane. Um, in, in a short five years, short when a short five years after he was released, a Cleve Broder committed suicide due to depression. Due to that, he went in totally sane, nothing wrong, a man with a bright future, and came out um, with all kinds of, of mental health issues and eventually committed suicide. I have a, a personal story uh, of a, a very close um, young man uh, to. A, man, a young man that's very close to me that, that is in a similar situation now that uh, was charged as an, as an adult, as a juvenile, and now is having problems coping with the fact that he was charged as such and even having problems filing jobs as, re, as a result. Uh, kids' lives are absolutely being, being ruined by, by this type of thing happening. And so um, I, I, I support this fully, and I, I thank Commissioner Dozier for bringing it to the table. And as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, this is not total, this is just um, creating a hearing so, so that it can be reviewed, correct? Uh, it's not necessarily taking it completely out of the uh, public, I'm not public, but state attorney's hands, but it's just giving the judge the discretion to say, you know what, I don't agree with this. Uh, and, and that is something that a judge should have discretion over, so I do support it. I have no more speakers in queue to speak. Um, the motion on the floor is for option number two made by Commissioner Proctor, seconded by Commissioner Dozier. All those in favor of the motion on the floor came by saying aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Uh, Mr. Administrator, we'll get through the next item and then we will take a break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Commissioners, this item provides a status report on Leon County's uh, preparation, response, and recovery efforts related to Hurricane Michael. Uh, the item is consistent with our practice of providing with the board with a status report immediately following an emergency activation. As you may recall, we provided similar status reports to you immediately following Hurricanes Hermine and Irma. I should note, Commissioners, this is not our after-action report. Um, at this time, we're still fully engaged in our ongoing recovery efforts. I will present uh, uh, that to you with a, uh, or I'll present you with the comprehensive after-action report uh, within 90 days as provided by our CEMP. Today, I'm just going to hit the highlights, Commissioners, again, as part of our protocol on our preparedness, response, and recovery activities. Uh, this overview just scratches the surface. The agenda item that you have in your materials obviously goes into much, much more detail on that. Additionally, we have FEMA representatives here today. Thank you for being patient, uh, and I'll get to you in just a moment as I wrap up uh, just a few, again, brief highlights, and then, as I mentioned, we'll turn it over to, um, to our FEMA representatives who we're fortunate enough to have uh, with us here today. Uh, commissioners, again, Michael was an unprecedented catastrophic storm. It was the third most powerful storm to ever make landfall in the continental U.S. I'm sure you're used to hearing uh, facts like that. 
Uh, it was the most powerful to ever impact Florida's panhandle or the Big Bend. Uh, as such, uh, although we managed to escape the worst possible potential impacts with no uh, loss of life in our community, uh, we prepared uh, for the worst case scenario. Commissioners, over the course of the incident, I'm just going to run down some numbers here. This is sort of the overview by the numbers version. Over the course of the activation, we initiated a long-term full-scale activation of our EOC, which operated around the clock for 194 hours, including 182 consecutive. Again, uh, another record. We don't like making those records, but that's, there's another one. We activated over 530 Leon County employees to participate in our response. That's 530 Leon County employees, not including constitutionals. Remember, we have uh, just about 900 county employees total in our workforce. Uh, we operated seven risk shelters, housing more than 1,500 citizens uh, and evacuees, and another 200 pets, I should note. Uh, we responded to nearly 500 EMS calls. It's about 72% over our normal call volume. We distributed 70,000 sandbags. We cleared 1,000 roads. That's about half of all roads in Leon County. We distributed, uh, we created um, points of distribution at 10 locations throughout the county, which operated for three days. Those 10 points of distribution distributed over uh, 500,000 bottles of water, 265,000 MREs, and 7,000 bags of ice. We served 1,800 citizens at our main library comfort station. We leveraged our communications and resources to help citizens stay prepared and informed, which reached nearly 3 million people. Uh, we answered more than 3,400 citizen information line calls during the activation. We coordinated lodging for more than 500 uh, uh, mutual aid personnel. We deployed 21 staff-led uh, assessment teams over four days uh, for, our, for the county's request for individual assistance from FEMA. And that was just during the activation itself. Commissioners, at this time, we are uh, continuing in, in our recovery efforts. We are continuing in our debris removal efforts on public and private roads with 38 trucks currently picking up debris. As you can look around town, you can see that they're practically uh, everywhere. Uh, here's a stat for you. We've already picked up more than we did over Hurricane Hermine by this point now. We've got about um, 54,000 tons of debris, uh, and we are expecting it to be um, double the amount that we picked up over Hurricane Hermine. Uh, we are coordinating with FEMA. Uh, who, again, I mentioned you'll hear from momentarily to establish Disaster Recovery Center at the main library. Uh, we're also preparing for the deployment of FEMA Disaster Survivor Assistance Teams, uh, which will assist citizens with doorstep registration for disaster recovery assistance. Uh, we're continuing to provide staff assistance uh, to the state EOC and our neighboring counties with their ongoing recovery operations. Uh, because of these ongoing activities, commissioners, we're recommending in your agenda item uh, that you authorize the chairman to extend our declared local state of emergency until our recovery is complete. Uh, that's what we're doing now. Looking forward, uh, commissioners, in the coming weeks, we will continue coordinating uh, to seek uh, FEMA reimbursement under our public assistance program for all the county's costs. We will continue to coordinate with state and federal partners to connect citizens and businesses to, to disaster recovery assistance resources. We'll be conducting our debriefing sessions with all of our staff and our partner agencies. We will be scheduling community listening sessions. You remember our community listening sessions, now part of our protocols. We will be scheduling those, which will inform our after action report, which will be coming back to you uh, within 90 days. Commissioners, that, again, is the highlights uh, from me. Um, your agenda item includes a full review of the, uh, of the full extent of the county's operations. Uh, let me just say that no matter how much we train, um, our, our practices and protocols and partnerships are always tested during these events. You've heard me say many times uh, that all of these events are different and they, they challenge us in different ways and they, and they teach us uh, new lessons. Certainly, Michael was no exception to that. We'll learn and grow and get better uh, from Michael uh, as a result of Michael as well. Uh, commissioners, let me just quickly thank 
uh, the board. Let me thank you for your, all your support throughout the event. I want to thank the chairman, Mr. Chairman, for always being available and accessible to us throughout the event. I'd also like to thank our constitutional officers, Leon County Schools, and many other emergency management partners, uh, including our, our, our nonprofit partners, many of whom are, are a couple of whom, a few of whom are, are, are with us here today. Um, I also like to uh, pay special thanks to our city manager and the, the city of Tallahassee. The coordination at the EOC was really, uh, commissioners, unprecedented, in my opinion. Uh, on that note, I'd like to thank our sheriff and his staff, as well as our superintendent. And I mentioned uh, Leon County Schools, but they certainly deserve uh, a special thank you. And of course, commissioners are Leon County employees. I can't even begin uh, to, to thank them enough. You heard me say over 530 of them. You'll be seeing more of that, too, at our upcoming uh, Employee Awards Breakfast. Kevin Peters, Matt Cavell are both here if you have any questions. But with that, I'd like to turn it over to our FEMA representatives. Again, thank them for being here. I believe Patrick Cornbill is the, uh, is the point person. So, Patrick, thank you for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time. I know you've had a lot to deal with uh, following this disaster and a lot of other agenda, uh, items on the agenda tonight, so I'll try to be brief. Uh, firstly, I'm pleased to say there is federal disaster assistance available in Leon County, both for individuals affected by the disaster and for public entities, such as the county, the city of Tallahassee, certain private nonprofits. And, uh, uh, but let me focus first on the assistance for individuals. Uh, individuals affected by the disaster can access federal disaster assistance through disasterassistance.gov and register online or they can call our 800 number, 800-621-FEMA, or 3362. And uh, we've had, uh, as of yesterday, close of business yesterday, over 4,500 Leon County residents call in to request federal assistance for, for individuals. Um, in so doing, in, in so calling, what is made available to them uh, is repair grants to repair their house, uh, if, if necessary, for homeowners or for homeowners or renters to replace uh, essential contents or rent another place to stay if they need another place to stay while repairs are being made. But let me uh, uh, take that moment to say, realistically, those grants are designed to get people a habitable place to stay following a disaster. They're not meant to replace everything people lost. Now, with that said, following that round of <coughs> housing grants, people may receive a Small Business Administration disaster loan application in the mail. Now, the Small Business Administration, yes, they do assist businesses affected by the disaster, disaster loans. They also offer disaster loans to homeowners and renters to replace things. So there's two things that can come out of that disaster loan application. One is there's a lot more money than our grants. It really can replace things they lost. And the other is if they're denied that loan, we use that uh, the information from those loan packages to refer people into additional grant programs. So it's very important that when people receive that, they understand that although it comes from the Small Business Administration, it's, it, it can be for homeowners or renters, and that, that may get them into additional grants as well. So I've, you've tried in vain to get them to change the name of the form, but it says Small, <laughs> small Business Administration. Huh? Um, with that said, uh, we also have uh, 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 disaster survivor assistance teams as the as the uh, commissioner mentioned, going door to door in affected areas. They can take registrations in person. They can follow up on people's registrations uh, face to face. Um, and we also have our recovery center open at the county library where people can go there to follow up on their application. You don't need to go there to apply. Uh, in fact, it's better to apply first through disasterassistance.gov or 1-800-621-FEMA. Uh, but they can go there to follow up on the application, submit required documentation, or access other government programs, such as uh, getting help with their uh, disaster loan application or other uh, state agencies. We have a uh, Department of Senior Services and Unemployment at the, represented so far, uh, and that we may add to that. Uh, that said, the, the assistance for public entities, so far what we have designated for Leon County is for our public assistance program is categories A and B, which is for debris removal and for emergency protective measures. Uh, includes things like overtime for your emergency services and things like that. Beginning tomorrow, we're going to start uh, an assessment of 
the permanent work category, so damage to public facilities and public property and things that, that take repair work. So those assessments are beginning tomorrow to determine whether or not Leon County will be added for any of those categories of assistance. Uh, we also have an Army Corps of Engineers uh, debris expert working with the county, uh, working closely with, with Kevin Peters, who's been uh, more than hospitable and professional with us, and we thank him for that. Uh, he'll, be, he'll be helping us with the assessments tomorrow, and he's working with the Corps of Engineers on the debris. Uh, we also have in the county an intergovernmental liaison, Nick, Nick Barbneck sitting behind me, who's a uh, liaison for uh, county elected officials, and, uh, and we're working with the city as well. Um, and our division supervisor, Don, uh, Don Wenshot, is still here. Uh, he's our primary point of contact for the county. I'm the, uh, I'm the deputy branch director for the, for, for the wider area, and I'll be, I'll be around as well. So we're all here at your disposal. Uh, we're here to serve, and we thank you. We thank Kevin Peters so much for his hospitality and professionalism. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you, sir. Staff recommendations, options one through four. Is there a motion for staff recommendation? Is there any questions? Yeah, oh, I'm sorry. I got four Security, speakers. Yeah, we've got speakers. Yeah, sorry about that. Uh, and I also have Commissioner Proctor and Q to speak. Um, Mr. Administrator, we'll start with the speakers. First speaker is Sharon Tyler. Well, he said, do we have questions of him? Yes, do you have a question for him, Commissioner Proctor? I, I did. Yes, sir. Come on up. In terms of the declaration of emergency, is Tallahassee an equal uh, access uh, uh, recipient of all emergency cares in terms of uh, uh, loan abatements, uh, credit cards, all of that, that the eight. And I've been hearing that there are things in Tallahassee that we did not qualify for in terms of emergency uh, good goodies. FEMA's disaster declarations and designations for eligibility for assistance are done by county. So everything within that county. So they, they, they would be equal. Okay, and that was declared fully in our county. And, and, and Vince, do we have a full declaration? Okay, great. Thank you very much. Speak. First speaker, Sharon Tyler. Name and address for record, please, ma'am. Good evening, everybody. Um, Sharon Tyler, Executive Director for Capital Area Chapter of American Red Cross. Um, my address I put on the thing is 5103 Wild Rose, which is where I live, but I used to live. <laughs> As of late, I live at 1115 Easterwood Drive, which is where the chapter is. Um, so I, I feel your pain as far as all the folks being at the, um, the EOC for so long. Um, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you for, your, for our partnership that we have with the county. Um, it, it's a longstanding good partnership, and we appreciate that. Um, this, has been, um, this has been our Katrina, guys. Um, I hate that John had to leave, but I, I also feel with him with the emotion. I can, I can barely get through talking about this hurricane because this is us. Um, this is not a hurricane that we're, that Irma that skidded through and, and went somewhere else and affected us. Um, whereas we were blessed to have missed a good part of the damage. Um, our neighbors to our south and our um, southwest did not. And it, many of you and many of us, that, those are our family. Those are our friends that, that lost things, lost homes, lost dreams, lost lives. And um, so I'll just throw a few numbers at you um, to date we've, with our partners, some of which I think are here. I thought Rick Miner was here. So Second Harvest and Salvation Army are huge partners of us. So we've, set, we've fed over 700 or served over 700,000 meals with them since the onset of this. Um, we've given out, Red Cross has uh, over 100,000 disaster emergency service um, items, and that can include bleach, tarps, rakes, cleanup kits, et cetera. Um, we have over 1,100 people on the ground here. Um, we actually had Governor Scott come speak, and he was encouraging people to, um, our volunteers, to give back to the community. And so I'll let you know about 700 of those 11,000 are here in Leon I mean, 1,100 are here in Leon County, and, and they are frequenting our restaurants. And um, they're not staying in our hotels, however, that most of them are staying in our, what we're calling our tent city mega mini mega shelter which is located out near the airport and um, appreciate our partnership with with FEMA and other folks that are letting us work with them um, and house our volunteers out there as well. Here in Leon County um, we partnered with the county and with the school system for our evacuation centers, um, a new term that we're really trying to get people to wrap their heads around and understand that an evacuation center is a um, lifeboat and not a cruise ship and Matt, 
give you credit for that term. I think it's a great term um, that, that we use. It's, it's something that's really important for people to wrap their heads around to understand that it is a safe place to stay and there will be no mints on your pillows if you even have a pillow there. Um, so uh, for the evacuation centers, there was about around 1,000 people on the Wednesday of the, the day the storm hit. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what it went up to um, just because I've got 12 other counties besides Leon County that I was having to focus on as well. Um, we served in Leon County, though, Red Cross, 16,464 meals um, and delivered 771 disaster supplies. Um, our emergency um, teams that go out and do our damage assessments are continuing to do hot spots. Um, we didn't have too many homes that were totally destroyed, thankfully, in Leon County, but many that are major, I mean, that have some major damage, lots more that have minor damage, and hundreds that have, that were affected. Um, probably most of us in this room were somehow affected, whether you lost shingles or not. Um, we do have lots of opportunities um, to revisit and to grow our partnerships with the school and the county. Um, I've, I've visited with, with some of you about some of the things that I think that, that we can improve upon going forward. But as Vince said, every storm is different, and every storm gives us an opportunity to see things, see ways that we can do things better. And so our goal at Red Cross is to make sure that our clients are taken care of, and we want to give them the best possible experience, whether it's in an evacuation center, whether it's in a host shelter, which is what we transition to after the storm has passed and the conditions are safe to do. Um, I look forward to having conversations with each of you and, and to discuss that. I think it's really important that you all have the information and understand what the what our agreements are. I found in Wakulla County that there were some issues with the commissioners not understanding what a, a Red Cross shelter looked like and, and what some of the agreements are. So I, in the future, I look forward to sitting down with, with all of you and, and Vince and with us just partnering together and really having some good conversations later. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks, Speaker. Okay. Dr. Rachel Pienta. Name and address for the record, please, ma'am. Um, good evening, commissioners. I am Dr. Rachel Pienta. When there's not a storm, I am the UF IFAS Extension 4-H Director. During the East storm situation, emergency situations, uh, extension staff are supposed to be serving the county. Um, I was not part of the emergency EOC response team except for floating ESF status before this, this storm. However, during the height of the storm, I kind of got a promotion, um, which probably Sharon may or may not be aware of. I should mention Wakulla County and our commissioners. Um, probably that promotion was in response to that confusion in Wakulla County. That's a whole other story. Um, that said, we are a small county in Wakulla County. We have less than 32,000 people to your just under 300,000. So it's a very different ball game. So emergency response is staff responding directly working with the county administrator. And just to give you an example of how small we are, we share one front end loader between departments. So that means when um, I opened a relief center in Wakulla County, that I had to share a front end loader to get pallets of emergency supplies off of a semi from Salvation Army with public works. So it's a different situation. That said, what, what I'm here really to address today is the role of county communication, intercommunication, and how we interact with aid agencies and the state EOC. Because during the height of storm response, what we found was that counties couldn't get into the EO, they could not get in contact with the state EOC, but they could get in contact with people in other counties. So instead of SOS calls for aid going to the EOC, they were going to other counties, like Wakulla County. So Wakulla County, in addition to meeting the needs of their own residents, started meeting the needs of all the impacted counties. Over the last however many days it is now, because I've lost track. Last night was the first night I, I got more than three hours sleep, so I'm a little sleep deprived. But we assembled basically storm response strike teams, and we took supplies into counties. We took the Liberty County EOC, sent out an SOS. I'm sorry, I need one more minute, Commissioner, Chairman. Go ahead. Um, you got 30 seconds from now. We'll keep okay, going. thanks. You're, you're different than mine. Um, 
I had the county attorney for Liberty County filling a trailer when he should have been at a county commission meeting in my facility. I got an emergency call from the mayor of Malone that they were in desperate situation. And because we have amazing residents in McCullough County, and I have to say that Leon County people came down and helped us. So we need to address this going forward, and I need us to partner as counties together so that when our neighbors are in trouble, we can all work together effectively, whether or not the state EOC is experiencing challenges. And some of those relate to communication technology and what failed during the storm. So the after action for all of this is going to be very interesting, but I just want to tell you that Wakulla is here at the table to be a partner with you going forward. Thank you, ma'am. Next speaker, Amber Tynan. Name and address for record, please, ma'am. Amber Tynan, 3100 Layla Street. Thank you so much. First, want to um, echo some comments earlier. You guys have done a tremendous job with the recovery efforts, and it makes me so proud to be a Leon County resident. Um, on behalf of my agency, so I do represent United Partners for Human Services. You heard from Red Cross. Um, we'll call a 4-H as a member. Um, Second Harvest, so on and so forth. They're doing tremendous work not only here in Leon County, but in our surrounding counties. And one of the things that we were hearing we're reporting back a lot of the needs from the smaller rural communities that weren't necessarily being communicated, as Rachel had uh, mentioned, from a larger entity. So uh, in locking arms with Kristen and Gary and uh, Chairman Maddox, thank you for coming out. We did a huge community-wide drive to focus on the really small areas in our sister surrounding counties to make sure that they had exactly what they needed. Um, we were able to load seven trucks, over 50,000 pounds of relief materials, everything from gas uh, cans to propane to food to clothing to f pet supplies, you name it, we had it, went there. But what we also saw were a ton of disconnects as it relates to if it goes to Calhoun but it no, or to Bluntstown and it needs to go to Alpha, it's not getting to Alpha. Um, so I'm here to support on behalf of our member agencies, but also the experience that we had last week to talk about having one sort of coordinated entity or effort that can really drive home where the needs are um, so that we can eliminate a lot of these one-off uh, collection efforts that are happening to make a bigger maximum leveraged effort, but to also really get the need to the communities that need them. But again, my hat's off to you for everything that you've done. Thank you, Kristen, for locking arms. You're incredible. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Next, next speaker. Uh, last speaker, if she's here, Leslie Powell uh, Boudreaux. Okay. Thank you, Amber. I have Commissioner Pryor and Commissioner Dozier. Commissioner Deloge. Commissioner Dozier. Oh, Dozier. I, I, absolutely. Even more so. Just checking. Thank you, Commissioner Proctor. Um, Mr. Chair, I know this has been a long meeting. Um, we need to take a break before public hearing. So, and we're going to have a lot more time to discuss this. So, our county staff is amazing. I judge this storm success, Mr. County Administrator, and all of our staff and our partners because of the number of emails I got is so much smaller than Hermine. Um, if we've done our job in between storms, all we should be doing is sharing information, and um, I'm hearing this across the community, so thank you all. Um, 190 whatever hours and still going. Um, FEMA folks, thank you for being here. You've sat through a lot of our different items, and this is going to be the one that's foremost in our mind, even though business has to keep going. So thank you all very much for what you do across the country and here for sure. Um, I know the question about burning and air quality is going to come up in the after action. As county administrator, I would love to see some reflection on um, some counties in Georgia have put in an emergency. When there is a declared emergency, a burn ban, because people have their windows open, there's air quality issues, and it also per protects public sector employees. So I'd love to see something um, just reflecting on that when it comes back. I'm trying to go really fast here. Um, we had a really big issue, and I don't think District 5 is the only one, with um, areas where Talquin and city overlap in services. I actually had planned to bring this up on October 9th because we were having reoccurring power outages in Buck Lake. They're not city constituents, but they are city customers. Um, the emails that we're getting are identical to Hermine. So this is one, maybe one single issue that I didn't see progress on between the two, the last two years, so I'd love to lean in a little bit more with the city on that. But the big one here, and Commissioner Deloge, you mentioned FAC, um, Florida Association of Counties earlier, 
And again, I'm going fast. Amber, others, thank you, Rachel, um, for staying. And we've seen a lot of people in our fellow counties, like Rachel, like Amber, um, others, come into a role as kind of a distribution director or something like that um, when we we don't have all the information. Rachel, you, you mentioned yesterday when we were talking, you didn't have intake forms to track people who were coming for help, whether they were Leon or Wakulla. The Regional Planning Council would like to help coordinate um, a task force, for lack of a better phrase, right now. And my ask, Mr. Chair, um, in making the motion for staff options, and I discussed this with the Deputy County Administrator, is to have volunteer Leon participate in this task force. I would love, um, as you, uh, your president of fact to reach out to them if you agree. We have an ongoing need. We have counties that are trying to say what they need. We have donors that want to help. This community has been phenomenal in, and all across the state. But I am so proud of Leon County and Tallahassee for what we've done. But there's a disconnect, as um, Amber and others and Rachel said, between what is needed, the donors, and the volunteers. And we have some ideas right now in Regional Planning Council. We need a central source so that Liberty County knows where to send their needs list, and that list can be communicated. It should be organic. So um, if I can add to the motion, and Mr. County Administrator, you and I didn't discuss this, but it, I'm sure Alan filled you in. So um, if Volunteer Leon could support as co-ad, and we will stand up this task force, that's part of the motion. So there a second to the motion? And staff recommendations. It is to have the staff recommendations, but volunteer Leon. This would be a regional planning council coordinated effort with our partners, UPHS. I'm sorry, I'm moving pretty fast. Red Cross, Second Harvest. Would love to have Forestation Association. This is something that long term, something like this could help with the Carabelle fires or something else. But the need is tomorrow. It was yesterday, it's next week, it's going to change in a month. So we want to get this group together as quickly as possible so we can find a way to start better coordinating this information. State AOC, FEMA, very helpful, but you've got your charge. So we want to do this to help the donors. Motion Second made by person. Commissioner Dozier, seconded by Thank Commissioner Deloge. Commissioner Proctor, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, speaking of the state attorney's discretion to uh, direct file, I was disturbed that the school superintendent had the uh, singular discretion to take records offline as an uh, evacuation center. Um, that left a hole in that immediate part of the community, and uh, people were on the morning of not knowing where to report to evacuate. Um, I could not recognize with upon eyeball inspection uh, what would make uh, Rickards uh, an unattainable site as well as to be declared inaccessible with a, with a Category 4 uh, barreling uh, toward our area. Um, that's something that needs to be reviewed, and I'm asking staff to please uh, create a footnote explanation of why the south side uh, had no immediate uh, relief site or evacuation center uh, to it. This also underscores the uh, necessity of uh, the fairground um, having facilities that are not antiquated. And recall last year when FEMA, um, and I'm glad FEMA's here to uh, verify and validate, uh, initially set up at the fairground for about two hours. And shortly they, uh, a declaration was made that this cannot be the, the site and it would have to uh, move to um, Al Lawson uh, Gymnasium because the fairground site was not uh, adequate to a storm. Secondly, it did not have the, uh, the wiring and the uh, communications capacity uh, to meet the computers and the kind of stuff. We got a quorum, Mr. Chairman. I can stop right here and bring this up at the um, end of uh, our meeting, Mr. Chairman, uh, because I said we lack a quorum. Oh, well, we got a quorum. Well, no, we don't have a quorum. I can't take a vote anyway. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm ready to, um, I joined those who've already left and got in line to eat, and I think that we should do the same. 
I have a motion on the floor. I cannot take a vote. And there's a motion on the floor, which means I can't. There we go. Uh, uh, all those in favor of the motion on the floor, by saying aye. Any opposed? Motion carries 5-0. Uh, we will break for 15 minutes till 6 o'clock.